Hi everybody, welcome to today's presentation. My name is Naomi Casero. I'm a physiotherapist working in Vancouver. I work at NeuroAbility Rehabilitation Services, treating clients with a range of neurological conditions, and I also work for both Providence Healthcare and Vancouver Coastal Health in various capacities, but also treating both in, in both inpatient and outpatient neurorehab. So today we're going to be talking about Parkinson's disease and how you can join the exercise revolution. I want to send out a special thanks to Becky Farley and her team in Tucson for all their help and resources. They've been fabulous at giving me all the information I need and very generous with their time and also their slides. Another special thanks to PABC, the Physio Association, for making this happen um, and the support that they've given me along the way. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk a little bit about the background of Parkinson's disease, what it looks like, how many people there are in our community with Parkinson's. We're also going to talk about the research on Parkinson's disease. What does it say about exercise in Parkinson's and what can we do about it? I'm going to go over the pa Parkinson's wellness recovery paradigm and some tools that you can use in your practice to treat these patients um, as soon as they come in. And though this won't be as in depth as it was in the presentation that was live, we'll try and give you a few clips of the exercises and how you can use them with your patients in a functional way. We're also going to talk about resources in our community, so what's available, where can you send your patients, where can you get informa more information, and where can your patients get more information. In our live presentation, we got moving and did all the exercises and activities together. You can follow along when we get to that point at home um, and that's the move it part of the presentation. So how many people have Parkinson's disease? We know that in Canada there's close to 100,000 and approximately 11,000 in BC but the big important piece about this is that number is increasing and it's supposed to increase by 65 percent by 2031. So the question is why is that important to you? Why does it matter? And the answer is that people with Parkinson's are coming into your workplaces. If they aren't already, they're going to be, and they're going to be coming in in bigger numbers. So it's really relevant that we know how to treat them and where we can send them to so that they get the, the most out of their community and the resources that are available to them. So what is Parkinson's disease? We're going to talk a little bit about what the disease is and what it looks like, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So Parkinson's is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. It's marked by loss of substantia nigra pars compacta neurons and striatal dopamine. And people who are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease by at diagnosis have actually lost 60 to 80 percent of these dopaminergic neurons. Now because it starts unilaterally in most cases, they've lost 60 to 80 percent of their dopamine on one side, but that's still a very significant amount to have lost at diagnosis. And that also means that at diagnosis, they're already going to have changes in body awareness, in perceptions of distances and times, things like that. They're already going to have significant changes that have taken place. So this is just to make sure that we're all on the same page. We're going to have, uh, it's a picture of the brain, and you can see where the substantia nigra is. And the blue lines are the dopamine pathways connecting that to the striatum. You can also see where those blue lines connect to the front of the cortex. So that's just to give everyone an image so that we're all on the same page when we're talking about the research and a little bit about the neurological changes that are happening. We've all got the same picture in our head. So this is kind of the classic picture of Parkinson's disease. There's four cardinal symptoms that come with Parkinson's. The first is rigidity, bradykinesia, which is slowness of movement, postural instability, and tremor. Those are the four major symptoms, but there's also a huge host of other symptoms that come along with this disease. Things like changes in smell and taste. These patients will often have trouble swallowing. They have freezing, issues with constipation, with dementia or cognitive impairment, fatigue, insomnia. That's just a short list. There's lots of other things that come along with this disease that we need to be aware of when we're treating these patients. So this is what we would like our patients with Parkinson's to look like, active and healthy and excited to be exercising. 
So let's talk a little bit about what we can do to treat these patients and what treatments are available to them. There's three that we're going to talk about today, exercise, medication, and also other therapies. So we're going to start with medication. The big important things for us as physiotherapists is that meds are often used to optimize function to allow these clients to exercise and participate in the activities that we're asking them to do. Levodopa is the major medication that's used. It's a dopamine replacement therapy and it's the same medication that's been used for the last 50 years. It's still the most effective. One thing to keep in mind is that this medication has very significant on and off times. So there are times when your patients will be much more functional and, and able to exercise than others. So when you're planning your programs and doing work with these patients, that's just something to keep in mind. Another note that's important is that medication can't fix everything. One of the things that dopamine replacement therapies don't do as good of a job affecting or helping is the cardinal symptom of postural instability. So that's really important for us as physios, again, because we're going to be working with these patients and that's going to be a key focus for us is helping to improve their postural stability because it's, again, one of the cardinal symptoms that medication doesn't as strongly address. So other therapies, so as we talked about just a minute ago, these, this disease comes along with a whole host of other issues aside from the four main motor symptoms and because of that these patients are often going to be seeing other practitioners, people like speech pathologists, speech language pathologists for voice and swallowing, occupational therapists for activities of daily living and other issues and they're also going to be likely surrounded by caregivers and support staff or family that are helping them. So it's important to just keep that in mind so that we can integrate those other practitioners into our treatment plans and that we're aware that they're, they're going to be likely seeing other people other than ourselves as well. So exercise. We're going to take a look at the research now and talk a little bit more about why exercise is important in this population. So what are we going to do this with these patients? We're going to exercise with them, and the question is why. So let's talk about the negatives first and what the research says. So when it comes to exercise, the cons are pretty much none. The, none of the studies shows any, showed any adverse effects of exercise. Um, and now this doesn't mean that we don't have to address things like comorbidities, cardiac issues. We need to do our full proper assessment just as we would with any other client. But really, it's a very good sign that none of these studies showed any negative effects of exercise. Now, let's show a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about what exercise does do. We know that it does good things, and we're going to talk about exactly what it does. So, first of all, exercise has been shown to decrease the risk of Parkinson's disease. So, exercise in mid to early life has been shown to slow the progressions and actually decrease the chance that you're going to get this disease or delay the onset. Exercise is also extremely well supported to improve health outcomes for aging populations and decrease risk factors. We know that it can improve cardiovascular health, improve cerebrovascular health. It can decrease the risk of fractures and um, osteoporosis, obesity, dementia, depression, diabetes. There's a whole list of things that exercise help, helps with in the aging population. Now the question is again, why is that relevant to us and people living with Parkinson's? And the answer is that the majority of those who are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease are age 65 plus. So they're already more at risk um, because of their age and exercise we know can already help them because of their age, but now they've got the added issue of Parkinson's. So it's even more reason to be exercising with these patients. Um, research shows that at diagnosis, Parkinson's patients are less active than their age matched peers. So they're already being less physically active than people of the same age and we really need to get them not only to the level of their peers but hopefully above it because it'll make such a big difference for them and the progression of their disease and their, the Im impact that their symptoms have on their daily life. So ec the research tells us that exercise helps the brains and the bodies of those living with Parkinson's disease and we're going to talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about how that actually happens and what the research actually says. So we're going to start with animal models and the research shows that in animal models the deficits were, de Parkinsonian deficits were decreased with vigorous exercise and they were worsened by non-use. So in most of the studies they created 
Parkinson's like symptoms in rats or mice in one of two ways. They either created a global Parkinson's Parkinsonism or they created hemi-Parkinsonism. In the studies where they created the hemi-Parkinsonism, they often casted either the Parkinson side or the non-Parkinson side. By casting the non-Parkinson side, they forced use of the Parkinson side, and by casting the Parkinson side, they forced non-use. Now, that doesn't mean that this is the only way to show change with activity, but it's just one of the ways that they did it. And again, they showed that the mice and rats who had cat in which they had casted the Parkinson side showed a worsening of symptoms when it was not used, whereas when they casted the other side and they forced use of the Parkinson side, those symptoms improved. So how did those symptoms improve? What's actually happening to create change? We're going to talk today a little bit about two ways that that can happen. These are not the only ways, but they're the two that we're going to delve into today. So the first is neuroprotection. One way that neuroprotection can happen is by protecting the brain from neurotoxins. This is mediated by neurotrophic factors, and we're going to get into that in just a little bit. Another way that you can create neuroprotection is by sparing of dopamine, so actually helping to keep the dopamine, that 20 to 40 percent on the affected side and the, the whatever they have left on the side that maybe isn't as affected yet, and actually see how, see how much, try to spare as much of that as you, can, as you can, try and keep as much of that in the brain and functioning as you can for these patients. A third way that you can create neuroprotection is by reducing inflammation and oxidative stress. Now that's important because oxidative stress is one of the major components that's thought to lead to the death of substantia nigra pars compacta neurons. So if we can decrease that oxidative stress, again, hopefully we can protect those dopaminergic neurons. Now neuroprotection is known to be most effective in early stages of the disease, so at diagnosis or soon after. When you get to the mid to late stages of disease, we're talking more towards neuro repair. So most of that dopamine may be gone, we may not be able to protect as much of it, but that doesn't mean that there's not other ways to help improve the functioning of the system, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So one of the ways that you can create neuro repair is or one of the ways that neuro repair is effective is by increasing dopamine transporters. So though you don't actually have more dopamine in the system, what it does is it increases the shunting of dopamine to where it's actually needed most. Another way that neuro repair happens is by shutting down other noisy circuits in the basal ganglia, so making the dopamine pathways clear and obvious and getting them to be as effective as possible. And a third way is to keep dopamine in the synapses longer. So again, though you're not actually increasing the amount of dopamine, you're making it as effective as you can and trying to increase the productivity of the dopamine that is left in the system. So we're going to talk a little bit now about human models. This is one really interesting study done by Alberts et al. in 2011. And what they did is they put PD patients on a bike and they either put them on a bike, a tandem bike with somebody pedaling in front or without somebody in front. And they created two different scenarios. When somebody was pedaling in front, the patients were forced to go at the intensity of that person pedaling in front. And in the other group, the control group, they self-selected their intensity. So they did three sessions per week for one hour each. And this is just one example of human models where this has been done. There's also been studies that have started to come out on body weight support, treadmill training and dance and other area, uh, modalities of exercise that have in, in, investigated this response. So we're going to focus in on one area here, which is the proposed response. We mentioned earlier when we were talking about neuroprotection, the neurotrophic factors, and we're going to take a bit of a closer look at that right now. So when these uh, researchers began the study, they found that high rate of forced exercise means an increase in neurotrophic factor release. Now that's an important piece to start with. People who have Parkinson's tend to have slow and irregular movements and that may limit their ability to sustain exercise at high rates or rates that are needed to trigger that neurotrophic factor release. Now why do we want that neurotrophic factor to be released? What happens when you have increased 
neurotrophic factor release. BDNF stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and GDNF stands for glial-derived neurotrophic factor. So when you get an increase in the release of these neurotrophic factors, you get neuronal protection, you get growth, and you get an increase in dopamine availability. So really good responses and a really important reason to have to try and create increased neurotrophic factor release. So if that's not enough, there's other things that also happen when you get an increase in these neurotrophic factors. Some of them include an increase in cognitive ability, increasing learning, and increase in memory. And again, these are things that we talked about earlier that are important symptoms to address in those living with Parkinson's. So what did the results of this study show? We already mentioned a little bit that they showed improvements in the animal studies and in the human studies they also showed improvements in the group especially that was forced to exercise at a higher intensity than they would self-select on the tandem bike. So they saw improvements in rigidity, improvements in tremor, improvements in bradykinesia. They also saw an improvements in writing and hand function, big differences in multiple areas. Lucky for us, they also did fMRIs, and this is a really interesting sh slide that shows us the result of those scans. If you look at the first brain image there, you can see that that's post-exercise. And if you look at inside the red circle, sorry about that, if you look inside the red circle, you can see the areas of activity in the dopamine pathways and the areas that are important for, um, or, sorry, the areas that are relevant to Parkinsonian symptoms. If you look on the far right, you can see that the same areas are active when these people are on medication. So in the post-exercise, that was three hours post-exercise and off medication. And on the far right, you see on medication. So you see that those are fairly similar. If you look in the middle, that's when they were off, at, off medication. You can see a significant decrease in activity in those areas. So what this essentially is telling us is that exercise is creating activity the same way that medication would. So it's a really important and visual image of how good exercise is at lighting up those dopamine areas. So what are the conclusions of, of this research? What does it tell us and how does that relate to what we're actually going to do? It tells us that the program should start early. We want to create as much neuroprotection as we can and we want to get these patients exercising in an, on a program that's going to be lifelong. We know that these programs should include intensive aerobic activity, preferably at a forced exercise level that's higher than what they would self-select. We know that programs should include salient functional movements, so we need to really address the four primary symptoms, motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And one way we're going to do that is by focusing on functional movements that are relevant and important to these patients. And one of the big conclusions from this research is that we should avoid inactivity. Globally with these patients, we want to get them active as much and as often as we can. What else does the research tell us? It tells us that when we exercise with these patients, we're going to help to change their brains. We talked about neuroprotection, we talked about neuro-repair. It also shows us that you can improve cardinal symptoms. So both the animal and the human study shows imp showed improvements of the, in the cardinal motor symptoms in these patients. Also, it shows that you can improve other Parkinson's symptoms related to Parkinson's disease. Again, we talked about things like cognition and memory that are very relevant to these patients, and exercise can also help to improve those. We know that through neural protection, we can actually potentially slow down the disease progression for these patients, which is really important and a key piece in explaining to them why it's so important that they exercise and why they do it early on and for life. So we're back to this slide. We talked a little bit about the medication. We talked about other therapies. And now we've talked about what, what, the, exor what the research says about exercise and treating Parkinson's disease. Now we still have this question about what are you actually going to do when these patients come into your office, what your clinics, your hospitals, wherever you may be treating, how can we actually treat them in an effective way? So we're going to talk about that a little bit more now, and we're going to talk about it, one way that we're going to discuss it is through the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery Paradigm. So what is Parkinson's Wellness Recovery? This is a paradigm developed by Becky Farley. You can see at the top of the pyramid is power, and in the middle is exercise for brain change. So exercise for brain change is the framework that's built off the essential research principles about how to exercise to optimize brain health, brain change, and function. 
So what we're doing is taking that research and translating it into real world programs and function. So below that you see Power Gym. Now Becky has a center in Tucson where she treats these patients and has classes and one-to-one -one therapy. But also this can be done through therapy in hospitals, therapy in clinics, community programs, fitness programs. There's a whole host of different ways that we can create programs for these patients and address their needs. Becky, Becky does a five-day power uh, Parkinson's wellness recovery retreat in Tucson as well. So some of you may have some experience with LSVT Big, and so we're going to talk just briefly now about some of the differences between power and LSVT Big. So first, the similarities. They're both treatments for Parkinson's disease. They're both designed um, and developed by Becky Farley, and they're both amplitude focused. Now there are some differences between the, the two, and this is just a few of them to give you an idea. Power has four movements that are built to be the building blocks of function, and LSVT is seven, has seven exercises that were driven by the LOUD protocol. Power has five positions, so you can do these activities in supine, in prone, in high kneeling, in sitting, and in standing. And for big, they have two positions, which are sitting and standing. Power is designed to be a framework and paradigm that is adapting with the research. Um, LSVT Big is a protocol, so right now it is the same protocol to give out to, that you would give to patients. Um, those exercises, those exercises currently are not changing. Power is can be done in various ways. So it can be done in groups. You can do it one to one, and you can have fitness professionals do it. So there is a power course that is for instructors, which can be kinesiologists, they can be rehabilitation assistants, there's various people that can learn to teach group classes based on this paradigm. LSVT is one-to-one -one, and it's a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist who does, who works with the patient. So these are power moves at a glance. So it gives you an idea of those postures we were just talking about and the four basic moves which we're going to talk about right now. So power boosts, we're going to be doing just a little bit of this in our practical, so I wanted to draw your attention to it. What they are is the addition of breath, hand movements, voice, and directional eye movements that you can add into the power moves to make them more complex or to focus on areas that are difficult for your patients. So these are the four basic power moves. Power up is focused on anti-gravity extension, so getting those patients out of that stooped, rounded position and up against gravity, working their extensor muscles. Power rock is directed at weight shifting. Power twist is to create axial mobility in these patients. We know they tend to be very stiff. If you think about things like shoulder checking in a car, rotating your body, those are really important pieces of movement that Parkinson's patients often don't get. And power step, so that's to work on transitions. And we know that transitional movements are very hard with those for those people living with Parkinson's, they often get freezing, they get small steps, they have difficulty from sit to stand, lying down, things like that. So, we're going to get moving now. We're going to show you a few of these power moves. You can follow along with me. We're going to go through the basics. I'm going to show you a few boosts, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you can make these really functional for your patients.